This video gives an example exam questions on margins analysis and lead lag compensation. <coughs> so the purpose of this video is to give students some examples they can use to test their own understanding. Now in order for that to work you need to pause the video once you've read the question and try it yourself before you look at the solution. We're going to assume you're familiar with the previous videos in this series and use a standard unity negative feedback loop like the one shown here, with the only difference being that the question might use K of S instead of M of S. So some background. Before we start, remind yourself of the mechanistic rules for lead and lag compensation, because you might need those, and remind yourself of the attributes of lead and lag compensation, and therefore what each component can offer. The focus here is on paper and pen solutions, as would be required in an exam. However, I would still remind you, after you've done your work, to use MATLAB tools to check and make sure that you haven't made any silly mistakes. So here's the question. Using hand-drawn, that's key, because that's what you've got to do in an exam, Bode, Nyquist and root loci plots, analysed the closely behaviour of a system G and you're given a scalar gain k equals 4 as one possible compensator. And having looked at that, hence discuss the expected impact of these two compensators, k1 and k2, where k1 is given here and k2 is given here. And you're given another piece of information, that is that root 3 is the phase crossover frequency for the original system. So here's the original system. And what we're going to do first is we're going to start by constructing the Bode diagrams and see what that tells us. So just remember that system, you've got 6, s plus 1, of s, s minus 1, s plus 3. And of course, now is the time to pause and try by yourself before you look at the solutions, which I'm going to provide. OK, Bode sketches. First of all, let's look at the key frequency ranges that we've got here. We've got omega less than 1, 1 less than omega less than 3, and omega bigger than 3. Now, if we look at the slope of the gain plot and the phase, and remember, what we're doing here is we're looking at asymptotic information. So in case you've forgotten, what we're looking at is 6s plus 1 over s s minus 1, s plus 3. So first of all, you can see there's an integrator. So the initial slope is going to be minus 20. I'm not going to bother with the decibels per decade. That's implicit. When you go through a frequency of 1, you'll see there's an s plus 1 and <coughs> an s minus 1. So the slope, 1 in the numerator, 1 in the denominator. So the slope won't change. And then you go through an s plus 3, which is a pole. So the slope will go to minus 40. Now, what about the phase? Well, we need to remind ourselves of what the argument of s minus 1 will be, and that's going to be 180 minus 10 to the minus 1 of omega, and so the argument of 1 over s minus 1 is going to be minus 180 plus 10 to the minus 1 of omega. Or finally, what you're going to get is the argument of g is therefore going to be minus 270, so you get the integrator and this minus 180. You're going to get plus 2 10 to the minus 1 of omega, and then minus 10 to the minus 1 omega over 3. Now I need that so I can do the phase asymptotes. You'll see for low frequencies, minus 270. When I go through omega equals 1, you'll notice I've got a 2 10 to the minus 1 of omega, so the phase is going to go to minus 90, or at least the asymptote is, and then you get a minus 10 to the minus 1, and so you'll go back to minus 180. So that's step number one to actually capture the key asymptotic information. And the next thing we want to do is ask ourselves, are there any key values that we can put in? So let's see what we've got. First of all, you're told omega equals root 3, implies the argument of g equals minus 180. 
<coughs> so that's a useful value. I might also try some frequencies close to that, because that would be useful. One is an obvious one, because it's one of the poles and zeros. So if I do omega equals 1, I get argument of g equals minus... Um, so I get myself straight, minus 270 plus 2, 10 to the minus 1 of 1, minus 10 to the minus 1 of 1 over 3, and that is, if I just write this, it's minus 180 minus 18, and I might also try omega equals 5, something just a little bit to the other side of the phase crossover frequency, so we get minus 270 plus 2, 10 to the minus 1 of 5, minus 10 to the minus 1 of 5 over 3, and this is going to give you minus 171. Okay, so <coughs> I've now got the phase at three frequencies, which hopefully will be enough. Now what about the gain? I might want to check the value of the gain at some of the key frequencies. Now I'm particularly interested in this one, because I know that's the phase crossover frequency exactly, I'm given that. So it's logical to find the exact gain at that frequency. So the modulus of g of j root 3, what are we going to get? Well, we're going to get 6 times root 4 over root 3, root 4, root 12, which gives me 6 over root 36 which gives me 1. And so what do you notice? At the phase crossover frequency, the gain is 1. So the gain and phase crossover frequencies happen to be the same. Now the other thing I need to do is construct my asymptotes. Okay? So at omega equals 1, modulus of g is approximately, remember this is an asymptote approximation, we're going to get 6 times 1 over 1 times 1 times 3, which is 2, or 6 decibels. And hopefully that's given us enough information now to construct our Bode diagrams. So here's the Bode diagrams. So we'll start with the Bode, uh, the gain asymptotes. Now you'll notice a frequency of 1 written down here, 10 to the 0. We said the gain asymptote at that point was 6 decibels. That's about there. To the left of that, we had a slope of about, well not about, of, of 20 decibels per decade. Now it's quite hard on screen to plot these accurately, but I'll do my best. So we follow that until we get to about root 3. Sorry, I didn't do that particularly well. So I better um, rub that out and try again. It's, as, I, as I said before, it is quite hard to do these well on the screen. I'm not sure if that's much better, but anyway. So that's supposed to go through 6 decibels at omega equals 1. And it will keep following that until you get to about root 3. So root 3 is around here. After that, the slope is going to go to 40 decibels per decade, approximately. So there's our slope of 40 decibels per decade. So there's our Bode diagram, okay, um, or Bode asymptotes, or roughly as close as I can do on the screen. Now the other thing you were told is that at root 3 you actually went through 0 decibels. So that's how I know my asymptotes are a bit too low, but it's good enough for a sketch. What about the phase plot? Well, in terms of the phase plot, we said you started at minus 270, and what values did we have? Well, we said at root 3, we had minus 180 degrees. So I go through there. We said at 5, you had minus 170 degrees, which is about here. And at 1, you had about minus 200, which is about there. So your plot is going to do something along those lines. OK, so there's your phase plot. So we've now finished our bow diagrams, but before we go on to analyse these, let's go on and look at what we get for our Nyquist diagram. Now what you need to do before we get to there is look carefully at the quadrants that we've got, on, got in here. And you'll see that this one is 
quadrant 2. This one is quadrant 3. So that's quite important that you remember which quadrants we're in. So we're starting in quadrant 2 and then we're moving into quadrant 3 but the other thing is we're finishing in the minus 180 degree direction. Now the other important information of course is this. If we look at the crossover frequencies we see that both crossover frequencies are the same so we must be going through the minus one point. So let's look at the Nyquist diagram then. So we know we're going through the minus one point. We know we start in quadrant two. Well, this is quadrant two here. We know we move into quadrant three, which is here, and then we go back to minus 180 degrees. So therefore, the plot must be doing something along those lines there. OK, put some arrows in to mark increasing frequency. Add your right hand turns. There we go. Make sure you've got the right angles. And there's your Nyquist diagram. Now one of the things you might want to do with this Nyquist diagram is ask yourself how we use it. Well we use the Nyquist stability criteria NQ equals NC minus NO. Now I would advise in an exam make sure you write out what NQ means, NC means and NO means but we'll save a bit of time here by not doing that. But clearly NQ we're looking at encirclements of the minus one point. Now, because we're going through the minus one point, it's not clear cut. So what we're going to do is consider a slightly bigger k and a slightly smaller k. But before I do that, I'm going to state the obvious, which is NO equals 1. You'll see you have one right half plane pole. And therefore, you're stable if and only if NQ equals minus 1. So you need a counterclockwise encirclement of the minus one point. So first of all, let's see what happens if k is less than one. If k is less than one, and I do that in red, then this Nyquist diagram is going to come down like this one here. OK, so we've done it in red. And what you'll see is you get a clockwise encirclement. That gives you nq equals plus one which implies that NC equals 2. So you're going to have two right half plane closed loop poles if K is small. If K is bigger than 1, then you're going to get a Nyquist diagram a bit like this black one. And again, you see I'm being relatively crude just to get the key shape. And what you see is in that case, NQ equals minus 1. So NC equals 0. So your closed loop stable if and only if k is bigger than 1. And these are the sorts of insights that the examiner will be looking for. Clear demonstration of first, get the Nyquist diagram correct. Second, make sure you know what the Nyquist stability criteria is. And then, of course, can I implement that correctly to make inferences about closed loop stability? What's next then? The root loci. So let's just rewrite the transfer function, although in an exam you'll have it in front of you. Here we haven't. So what's the first thing to do? Mark down all the poles and zeros. So I've got a pole at 1, a pole at 0, a pole at minus 3, and a 0 at minus 1. Next, ask ourselves how many asymptotes. Well, clearly we've got two asymptotes because there's three poles and one zero. If we want to get the centroid, then we do the sum of poles minus the sum of zeros over two, which in this case is going to give me one plus zero minus three minus minus one all over two, which gives me minus a half. So the centroid of the asymptotes, and I'll mark that with this vertical black line, is there. At minus a half. And finally, consider which bits are on the real axis before I go to the asymptotes. Well, clearly, odd number to the right tells me that these bits of the real axis are on the loci, so therefore these two on the right must come together and do this and go off to the asymptotes, and the minus three goes to the zero at minus one. Okay, so there's your root loci.
Now again, what you'll notice, if I draw it in red, over here you've got two right half plane poles. Okay? Until the loci moves into the left half plane, you've got two right half plane poles. So now what we do is we need to do a discussion. Now we've done some of this already, but best to summarize. So the Nyquist has told us if k is less than 1, we have two right half plane poles. So we are closed loop unstable. If k is greater than 1, then we're closed loop stable. That's what we learn from Nyquist. What do we learn from the root loci? We learn that if k is small, it doesn't give us an exact value, we have two right half plane poles. If k is large, then we have all left half plane poles, but, and it's key, very oscillatory. So if I go back to the previous page, so you can see, if you look at where these poles are, once they get into the left half plane, what you noticed, small real part, large imaginary part, we're going to get lots of oscillation. So we've got similar insights from the Nyquist and root loci, which gives us confidence, but slightly different insights as well. Okay. Now what about margins? So let's go back and look at our diagram. Now at the moment the margins are zero, but you remember we were told to look at what happens if k equals 4. So if k equals 4, I'm going to lift the game plot by 12 decibels. And that means an equivalent calculation is looking at the intercept with the minus 12 decibel line. So let's mark this across. Now I'll do it as reasonably as I can, accepting that I'm doing this on the screen, so it's not ideal. So if I do that, you will see the gain crossover frequency has changed. And so now the phase margin is calculated in here, and it's going to be of the order of 10 degrees. So what do you get from the margins? k equals 4 implies that the phase margin is approximately 10 degrees. This is small, so expect poor behavior. And you notice that this reinforces what you said down from the root loci. Okay? That yes, you can make it stable, but the poles have got a large imaginary part, and so you're not surprised if you get oscillation. Okay, so let's carry on looking at the discussion in more detail. Now we've sort of done k equals 4 already, but we'll just repeat it. So with k equals 4, 1, you stabilize. That's important. Emphasize that. There'll be a mark for saying that. Okay, 2, estimate the phase margin. Well, we've done that, but again, there will be a mark for it, and there'll be a mark for also demonstrate. Demonstrate clearly how you did that. And of course, what we did is we looked at the minus 12 decibel line for the new, I should have put that, for new gain crossover. Now, that was the easiest way of doing it. There are alternatives, but that, of course, was the easiest. So there's not much to do here. Okay. And finally, of course, you want to reiterate that you've got poor margins and poor behavior. Those are the sorts of things that the examiner will be looking for. Okay, what next? What about this particular compensator for s plus 2 over s plus 5? So first, note this is a lead. Okay, so we want the pole and zero near the gain crossover. Okay, near the gain crossover frequency. Okay, now what I should add to this is we should put, and I'll put an hour here, the target gain crossover frequency. Remember, it's not the original gain crossover frequency, or at least not necessarily, but where would you like 
the gain crossover frequency to be. So let's go back to the Bode diagram. Now what can you see? What you can see, if I draw it in red here, that the best place for the gain crossover frequency is going to be somewhere around here. Now that's a frequency of 4. Why do I want it there? Because that's where the phase is already the largest and therefore I have the opportunity to make the phase margin the largest. So I want the gain crossover frequency to be somewhere in the region of 3 to 4 radians per second. Okay, so the target is going to be 3 to 4 radians per second. And what you will see is 2 and 5 do indeed bridge 3 to 4 radians per second. And therefore, in correct place. All right? So it's important that we've actually looking at this compensator and we're saying it looks to me like you've put the pole and zeros in a sensible place. All right? Now, the beta equals 2.5. So the phase lift is going to be somewhere like 20 to 25 degrees. Nobody's going to worry if you get it exactly correct or not. And therefore, the new phase margin is going to be 30 to 35 degrees. Is this enough? OK. I would say it seems small. All right. You remember, because this system is open loop unstable, you can't use 60 degrees as a target phase margin. But 30 to 35 still seems small. And you'll notice it's a very simple observation to make that at the geometric mean of 2 and 5, which will be somewhere around 3, you'll get a phase lift of 20 to 25 degrees. So by inspection, you can work out roughly what the new phase margin could be. So new phase margin, I should emphasize that, could be. And of course, you've still got to check the gain. So what's the gain of this system? So if I put at omega equals 3, the modulus of k1 is approximately 4 over root 2.5, which is approximately 3. Now, I'm being very crude here because you're doing this in an exam. And you're not going to be tested, or certainly not by me, on using precise numbers. And that's about 10 decibels. So at omega equals 3, you're going to move the game plot by about 10 decibels. So let's go back all right, and look at this Bode diagram. So if we move the gain plot by about 10 decibels, and we lift the phase plot by about 30 degrees, what do you notice? Well, what you'll notice is that you're actually corresponding to this black line. This black line corresponds to omega equals 3. OK? So this gain is about right to make omega equals 3 the gain crossover frequency. So that's good. So what you can say is you can say this is about right. OK, nobody's asking you to be precise. You're in an exam. So you can say from your perception, this lead compensator, it's got the frequencies in the right place. It's got the gain to be roughly the right value to make this 3 the gain crossover frequency. And it's improved the phase margin reasonably well. So overall, you're saying this lead compensator looks to be about right. Nobody says it's perfect. You can't in an exam but it's about right. What about the next compensator? Now this one's a lag. So what are you going to say? This is a lag, adds negative phase. So the new phase margin will be approximately 5 degrees. OK, so if you remember, it was approximately 10. So this is bad. OK, there's no point adding a lag compensator when the phase margin is already so low unless you've also got a lead. But that's not what the question said. The question said, just use this compensator on its own. So at the moment, it looks bad. You could also comment that the corner frequencies, however, you know, are a decade below your gain crossover frequency, 
so broadly correct okay so you've got the the issue here is you can spot that the corner frequencies are put in the right place however you can't use a lag on its own okay you can only use with a lead okay and that's the question done now just a reminder please use MATLAB or other tools to check your working.